Hello and welcome to Eric Passer Bank. My name is Jonas Tallinn, I'm Head of Asset Management and I will give you a brief update on our house view. Uh, we were thinking about making this a short version but I'm leaning against a bit longer version and that's because we will, be, um, we will not make an update in the coming week as I'm out traveling making a live presentation in, in, in Marbella but we will be back in two weeks time. There are some new ingredients in this portf uh, portfolio, in this slide package that I really want to highlight. We call them the, the golden fish hook and the green spend indicator. Both are bullish equities. I, I, should, I can cut straight to the chase. But before that, very quick update. Uh, yes, our medium risk portfolio is still uh, well ahead of its peers. Uh, we're in actually increasing the gap. The explanatory power behind that is that bonds and equities are performing equally bad. Hence, if you're able to capture the rebound in equities, that makes all the difference. And that's a simple playbook that's been true for, for a couple of years. So um, uh, a 60-40, 40-60 portfolio are equal as bad this year, about 16% to 6.5% down. We're down 5.3% uh, pre-cost. And the, the whole reason between that over 10% relative better performance is the tactical asset allocation that we're working on with FX exposures, wall hedging. Uh, we've been short equities, we're using cash positions and currency overlays. Um, and that has been working quite well. Since end of June, you're actually, or you have the double um, uh, the, the, the return, even if you had a 60-40 or over a 40-60 portfolio. And that is because the equity bounce that we saw in July has still got legs even though August has paid back some. So for us this is a, a year that we have to be very heavily tactically uh, uh, active. Our global uh, equity portfolio is down to 5.2 percent. Now you can already see there that our entire portfolio is 5.3, the equity is 5.24, i.e. Uh, again underline the, 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 uh, the assumption we make that um, the things are as bad in rates as in our inequities. A global benchmark down 16.6 .6, uh, and there's a lot of work here and uh, we have made a few more trades. Uh, we actually bought uh, US equities in sterling uh, this week. We want to take advantage of the fact that if you look at one week risk reversals, 25 deltas, you can actually see that the option market is betting on a quite hefty rebound in, in, in spot, in cable. Uh, obviously, a pound stock here will be dragged along, uh, hence we want to use that uh, risk event by also reshifting our portfolio into clean energy. We have also bought uh, uh, Indian equities uh, and we have chose to do that in euros. Uh, and we will come back to that as well. So here's our geographical exposure. Very small exposure to the eurozone. If you could have none, I would have none. Um, there are some headquarters that are formally in Europe, la, la, la. so, so we, we, we still have a 2% exposure. Apart from that, and this is before we sort of registered the, the, the Indian trade, it's in the books, that's why we can talk about it. Uh, but otherwise you can see it's still Japan, Latin America and, and China and so forth. Uh, this is just a blowout on our performance versus um, uh, the, the, the benchmark. Pre-cost, uh, we've never been better, uh, and that is true uh, for, for our, our main portfolio. And also our, our uh, really Article 9 global equity management is also doing quite well. So we, we're all all-time high, so which is, we can't really be cheerful about it because we're still down on the year, uh, but at least it's better than being on the index. So, uh, we think that things are playing out quite well. We're still in a soft landing camp. We talked about this the last time around with the beverage curve, uh, well defined by the U US Federal Reserve. We're still in a soft landing camp and actually the latest YOLTS data indicates that we're further into the soft landing, i.e. the Fed can be more hawkish, la -da -da, you had, had Jackson Hole. We have decided to fade the equity slowdown that happened after Jackson Hole and I will show you how we derive that, uh, that, that, that decision. Um, a couple of key risks that we look at, geopolitical risk, we still keep on watching that, the relationship between this and, and equity market is, is virtually zero and the, 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 uh, the geopolitical risk is quite low, it's on historical average since the Second World War. We keep a, a track on the natural gas inventory situation in Europe, yes we will be able to meet the European Commission goal of 80% target. Um, but we obviously see what happens in the futures in, in, in spot prices for, for, for electricity i.e. we want to be careful on, on European equities, i.e. Eurozone equities, also what's happening on the financial condition side. We are having a, a substantial proportion in, in, in Nordics, and I will show you why that is. Um, 
Now, another risk that we want to highlight is the, what I refer to as the media risk, i.e. media is almost three times as nervous as the uh, underlying market risk. I used, when I started working at the end of 1990s, the market made a tremendously good call in 98 to start to trade in risk for an IT, IT setback, basically. A lot more than media ever reported. And then the, the, everything you know, blows up, the media catches up. The same with the German recession in 2003, the same with the great financial crisis in 2008. And then something happened in 2016. We had Brexit, we had Trump. And from then, maybe we have clickbaits. I, I don't know, I'm not a media expert. All we can say is that we use very little media in our portfolio as it is. Political risk in the US, the next big risk. We have the midterm elections and the market is looking forward to that with, I think, some joy because what we can actually see now is the political risk and conflict is lowered, i.e. this one is actually rebounding quite hefty. And I think that is because we, we have a firm grip that the US uh, Republicans would take the House of Representatives. And we're not making a political call on that. All we know is that if we have a division of power between the two parties, between the Congress, i.e. the Rep House or the Senate and the White House, the, the equity market has its best years. And if you look back from the 21 last uh, midterm elections, uh, in 20 of those, the equity market actually climbs by 13.6% on average each year. So because the, the, the incumbent president is often losing power in, in the midterms, that's sort of the historical pattern. There's you know, it's nothing more to that. Um, and, and it's quite uh, easy to understand that obviously with a division of power in that sense between the parties, not between the different institutions, and you have a little bit more room for, for, for cross the aisle uh, policies. And that's obviously the market's uh, hope here. So it's pretty interesting. The other thing is, is CPI. And we put our heads and necks out in, in March and call this is the peak of price to CPI. We're still sticking to that. You look here and they all know how the break even has traded since March. It's just been not an even downward slope, but quite decide, decisive. So the bottlenecks after, after, after um, uh, the second sort of COVID is, is, is gone. The war premium is gone. Uh, so this is quite constructive uh, that the market estimates that break evens two years out is less than two and a half percent. Obviously, the equity market will wake up to this in due time. We've been arguing since 2021, the supply bottlenecks is also, are also withering away. And there's nothing new happening in these indicators, really, that makes us change anything. Actually, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, our own monitor of supply concerns, we're back almost on a historical average that we've seen since 2005, sorry, 2004. And the peak in CPI is, is pretty uh, well defined. In fact, if you look at Z scores on a various of measures, you can see how the deep red sort of withered away between March and April. And this is obviously correlated to the peak in the market. We can see the push uh, statistically up to March and then sort of falls out, uh, less and less push. You can actually start to see some blue in this graph, which is constructive, uh, very constructive. If you look at the wage pressure, uh, it's no secret that that peaked in January this year. I, when people talk about the coming pressure on wages, la da da, uh, do remember that all these indicators that are highlighting the wage pressure situation in the US, they peak way back. Front running the peak in price inflation, it's just a matter of time before the Fed can, you know, they talk tough because they don't want to deliver all the hikes the market is pricing in. So this is a little bit of a game we're now playing um, and we have to be careful to, to sort of uh, be, become too bearish on equities especially when the alternative is, is equal as bad. So this is quite interesting statistics to us. The most interesting is the one year uh, expected change in inflation, inflation rates in the US, which has peaked at eight and a half percent and now is down to 3% historical average, pretty much. And obviously, as you can see, the correlation to the CPI is, is quite well. Obviously, CPI will roll over. I mean, it's just, uh, and then if, if, if you can merit the Fed to this, if you can merit base effects to this, I don't think the market would care. The fact that the coming headline CPI numbers will come in lower and lower and lower uh, is quite encouraging. And if, it, if they make sort of a 0.3 month on month increase due to the base effects, we will actually be on very low inflation numbers again, again a lot quicker than consensus thinks. So arithmetically, it starts to look pretty interesting. 
Now obviously the Fed will hike, there are nothing updates on this really. Um, obviously they're gonna cut as soon as they're done hiking. That has been the case even before the hike started. So this, this is nothing new because we all knew that the CPI was gonna roll over by itself basically. Um, I don't care too much about the transitory this or that, um, but it's, it's a fact that we knew the Fed or sorry, the markets priced in a cut from even before they start hiking. And it's always been in the market. It's still in the market. So, so it's quite, quite interesting. Uh, if you look at more long term, if you look on this one, where you know the five year outlook for the Fed fund, uh, Fed fund rate is, you can still see it's hovering around two and a half, two seventy five percent. So it's nothing new here, really. So it's not like the market think that the Fed will hike, 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 and it's going to stick on that. If you compare the current hike cycle against historical hike cycles, you can see there's been a few instances where you had more an aggressive beginning. Um, but what sort of makes this one stand out a bit is that the, um, uh, you're actually leveling off a lot quicker than you've done historically. It always comes back to the same fact that we've been talking about since March. Uh, CPI is clearly peaked and, and will roll over quite, quite aggressively. There are no fundamental liquidity issues uh, from the quantitative tightening either, which is quite good. We have written a text here. You can, you can you know, pause the video and, and read about it, but it's, um, they've learned since 2018, 2019 not to do the same mistake again, which is good. Uh, we don't have to go through the balance sheets, uh, but obviously when they are, are squeezing this, headline inflation will, will also roll over. Now, this is a bit more interesting if you look at global financial conditions. Now we can talk hours about global financial conditions because there are those that are tightening, massively so speaking, and though there are those who are easing. So one has to be a bit careful here to measure apples and apples. If we measure apples to apples between US and Europe, we, we, which means that we have to make some, unfortunately, we have to lessen the degree of accuracy for the US because Europe is just, has it caught up with the depth of US data. Um, you can see clearly what happened in, in the summertime with the US it had a little bit nice rebound. We caught that luckily in the equity market and we can sort of ride this wave up to, to now at least, while Europe you have a completely different trajectory. There's a good explanation for this, and then it comes back to the systemic stress in European financial market is very high. And as a Swede, living in Sweden, we actually experience the most stressed uh, markets in Europe for the time being. Maybe that should be an, uh, an election discussion point for in the coming Swedish election, but I think that's a bit more on the nerdy level. But and, and at the end of the day, liquidity is an issue, regulation is an issue, um, the market is, 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 is making their choice by pretty much uh, avoiding it. And, but one has also to remember, if we trade Swedish equities, that's a completely different ball game than we trade the Swedish Krona. I will come back to this later on. Uh, but clearly, this is a good call uh, on this graph why we stuck to, to, to the US. Uh, we are encouraged by the fact that margin debt is not being taken out as much as before. And traditionally, if this holds, um, I shouldn't even call this a fish hook, um, but if it holds, this will be quite interesting if you can start actually to add on leverage on, on positions. Now, the Twitter sentiment is vaguely negative now, um, which means the equity sentiments will probably follow along. Um, we keep a track on that. We have made some reallocations in the portfolio. We have diversified into sterling, for example, and Indian equity markets. Um, and that's how we treat this as long as we keep a, a fundamental positive view on the equity market. And that's a, a different indicator we use for that. But due to the fact that we see this, we have acted in the, in the portfolios. So again, we want to be active. We have to be active in order to, to stay ahead of, of, of the index this year. In overall uh, risk market, if you look at rate spreads, CDSs, FX, fixed income, volume margin markets, <clears throat> they are still you know, positive, so it's nothing new here, and there's no major drama, which is good for the equity market, uh, more of a more monthly outlook, so to speak. Uh, if you look at the risk within the market, uh, for example, between equities, credits, or, or, or rates, uh, you can actually see that we had a, a risk off, not entirely risk off, I guess, to break the benchmark barrier. But now we're back on a very constructed level, which is obviously a positive thing. If we f concentrate only on the, uh, the, the conditions within the equity market, we can see that, yes, if you look at highs, lows, advanced declines, bullish bears, and, and wall, we can see sort of a little bit of squeeze going on. <clears throat> That's why we have acted to reallocate, but not taking off equity risk. 
and we will not take off equity risk until this indicator turns because this is sort of the uh, the main engine for, for our risk uh, template. This is the one that caught um, the equity trough uh, in 2020 on the day. And basically what we argue here is that the equity market as being the smaller market, following counterparty risk market, dollar liquidity market, and even wall markets, and even option markets in that sense. Um, and that has historically been, you know, natural fact because the equity market is, is you know, it's, it's not big enough, basically. It's actually the fact, as you can notice from the last couple of years, that the option market is directing the, 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 the direction on, on the spot market in equities, which is sort of a, perhaps not the best thing that's happened, but, but it's, a, it's a fact. And uh, I shouldn't speak too long on that, but the positive thing here is that the, these risk indicators are showing improved conditions, going back to financial conditions. Equity market is taking a bit on a chin here. Why we decided we will fail this, we will reallocate, but we will not take off risk. If things develop differently, we will act on that because we want we want to be active on, on top of things. Um, flows are, are also coming back, which is good in the equity market. We can actually see some retail flows coming back. Um, you could argue a bit late or wrong timed, whatever. Uh, they weren't around in the summertime. They missed the, the July August or sorry, the July rebound. Uh, so obviously, it's it's good at least that it's sort of the, the the confidence in rising equities is not as bad as it was in 2012 anymore. Um, gamma, I, I will not speak too much on gamma, but gamma is sort of this rubber band effect when we broke the zero in the summer, uh, which you can see here. Now, unfortunately, we're back below zero, so we act in the portfolio. But again, we fade this rather than taking off risk. Uh, if we look at speculative option volumes, uh, we can actually derive a pretty interesting uh, support for the equity market from spec accounts, which is sort of, well, I, we don't take, pay too much attention to what, what, what these players are doing, but it's, it's uh, a lot more nice to have them in our back than going against them, basically. Uh, if you look at exuberance, we can't really see that. If you look at the euphoria indicator, if you look at valuations versus vol, we're still very, very low levels. So it's, we're far from stretch in the equity market. Uh, China, we're keeping our, our large positions in China. Uh, China has squeezed out quite a substantial proportion of liquidity, uh, but the GDP is also looking quite solid. If you look at high-frequency data or like Kikang uh, index, uh, so we're not at all concerned as someone to be trade well with the PMI data and, and so forth. Now, obviously, we keep a close look at the shutdown in, in China that's taking place right now. We track uh, subway movements in China. Uh, we are encouraged by seeing the fact that more and more people are using the subway again. The economy is opening up quite rapidly. So we track some, some quite neat uh, gritty data here, obviously port activity, etc. Et uh, so we keep our positions there for the time being. Now we've added India, uh, but we added India also in sterling. Uh, the reason is that the Indian equity market, we believe, has not really uh, transformed into this lowered uh, economic risk that we see happening now in the in Indian economy. It, we can see that from uh, Citi's early warning signal. Uh, we can also look at high frequency data, which we can see that we had a pretty nice growth bump. Uh, now we still have a stable 8% uh, growth rate in, in India. <clears throat> which is sort of an interesting way of diversifying the portfolio away from the US in this instance. Um, we're taking the position of Sterling, as I explained previously, why we like uh, cable, but also Sterling Stocky during, during the risk reversals. Um, but the Indian case is quite interesting also if you look at more generic macro data like business expectations index, which you can see it's quite high, we, we, we can't argue with that. If you look at flows, performance, vols, skews, uh, etc., uh, the Indian equity market is, if you look at it for the past month or so, it's actually the top equity market in, in the world. It's a massive move into India, which we think is quite interesting to, to, to join. Uh, so equities in the first place, do remember that equities had already priced the recession as we've been arguing and when rates are doing equal is bad, we want to keep the risk where we can see a rebound. We do not believe that a recession will take place, I, we still believe there will be a rebound in equities as we saw during the summer. Um, this is also coming back to the fact that we think the Q3 reporting will be an upside surprise as Q2 was. Um, and this is the um, golden fish hook that I, I spoke about because there's a lot of talk about earnings revisions, price talk revisions and economic surprises and momentum. So these are just data points. So if we combine for S&P 500, for example, 
the earnings revisions, the price revisions, and economic surprises for the US. Um, we get this model, we only have data since 2008. Uh, but the blue here, the idea is the blue should should track the 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 uh, the, the sorry the, the 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 green should track the blue, hence uh, we should be able to depict the coming quarters uh, increase or decrease S and P 100 in, in in points. So basically, what we're looking at right now is that the Q4 should add a quite nifty uh, uh, value to to S and P 500. Right or wrong, um, we think we have earnings, price talk revisions, and open surprises in our backs. Cool. Uh, that, that, that we can sort of lean back and, and, and not become too stressed about the uh, so called alarming calls in terms of earnings. Because quite often, if you, look, if you read earnings articles, they do tend to look at a very short time frame. They do t- tend to use a limited uh, amount of historical data. We use everything here that we have since 2008. Um, and we think that's more fair in that sense. Um, Greenspan indicator is, is quite an interesting thought that he had in terms of appropriations compared to cash flow. Basically, are corporates saving in the barn for a, a worse day? Are they you know, l- limiting capex or whatever in order, in order to, to have cash flow for the future? And if you look at the current situation, they do not. Uh, i.e. they have abundancy of cash flow that they are, are planning to use for something else. We don't really have, we can't derive this, but I think it's an interesting thought that what if that something else is share buybacks? Share buybacks, as you can see here, is, is quite, quite alarmingly high or, or, or very aggressively high. And the whole idea here is that we all know that there will be a taxation kicking in from January of 1% on share buybacks. What if corporates are using or will really use the abundance of free cash flow to uh, support their, their equities and make share buybacks? That's a, that's a pretty interesting um, scenario or, 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 or potential that we want to, to make sure that we do not miss. Because in a year when rates and equities are equally bad, uh, missing stuff like this could, could, could make all the difference in terms of, of, of an index and return. Now, um, why no recession call in, in 2022? These are just the same old uh, models that I showed last week that we see a stable uh, US recession risk for the next 12 months of 20, 22-23%, nothing new really, uh, no higher, no lower. Uh, there is a risk, yes. Uh, is it enough to, to call equities on these levels? No. Uh, okay. Can we sort of join the camp of calling for recession in 2022? Uh, never. Uh, so this is more of an issue for us in 23-24 than it is today. If you look at the credit risk model, it's at 22-23% uh, as well. If you look at high frequency data, uh, no, you can't see recession in, in these daily updated GDP models. If you look at Goldman Sachs GDP model, no, you can't see it there either. So it's, it's very hard to find this so-called recession call that people tried to make before the US Treasury went out to media and said, please um, do your homework and, and start reading and, and reporting on how actually US GDP uh, is calculated on a quarterly basis. Uh, it's even so that some high frequency data is turning around. Sweden is no longer contracting. We had a contracting economy in Q1, that's gone. Uh, it's been revised to disappear. So uh, and they revised data back to 2018, which is a little bit of a shame because in the beginning of the year, we were all trading Sweden, Swedish equities on Swedish macro and we had negative GDP. We had recession calls, alerts, da da da. It's all gone. Swedish uh, equities are again, as they usually do, the large, large cap, uh, trading on US macro, not Swedish. Uh, so they have a completely different, different ball game. But it's pretty interesting how, how that, that call was sort of disappeared. But I'll come back to Sweden a bit more. On a, on a state level, we can't see a recession either. We can't see it from the SAM rule. We can't see it from business confidence, which is a bit more um, advanced than ISM, etc., etc. So if anything, this is a 2023-2024 story, but we can't trade on it uh, here and today. Our own high frequency model is showing no, no, no slowdown either. So this graph or slide is, is aggregating the uh, usual, not the usual, but the data is actually used to define a US recession. And as you can see, there is no sign of recession in these charts. In fact, you're still in recovery mode. Hence, uh, the equity market or the market has been too bearish for right or wrong reasons, we don't really uh, care too much, but we do see the potential for risk reward on, on the equity side. Now, Europe is completely different. Again, remember, we have no money left in the Eurozone. 
uh, we see a slowdown, we see falling in indicators, we see a high recession risk uh, for, for, for Germany. We can't really see uh, like it's happening now, it might not happen, um, but it's enough of a risk out there that we, we completely withdraw uh, funds and equities um, from, from that region. Now Sweden, uh, I, I spoke that very quickly and, and I will push on these few couple, couple of slides. This first graph is very important because it actually tells you that the relationship between Swedish macro and equities is uh, the, the opposite. So slower Swedish growth, <laughs> higher equities, because equities in Sweden is now trading on US macro. That's a world apart from where we were in the beginning of the year. And it's quite difficult to sort of follow along if you don't do this in numbers, I think that we were trading one theme in Q1, you, Swedish went into almost a recession camp and with fallen GDP, we trade on Swedish macro. Now that fallen GDP is gone, it's been revised away and we trade on US macro again. So a completely different ball game. Uh, and that's very important on the equity side. If you look on the FX side, which is obviously a lot bigger in terms of market size than the equity side, we are trading on Swedish macro. So uh, on, in terms of Swedish macro, we all knew that this is the graphs we've been using since January, that the real estate market was going to go into a, a terminal of oil and, and institutional money will move out of Sweden. That's been our call for the past nine months, nothing new. Um, we have acted by basically setting off any credit funds that are having exposure to this, this sector, um, trying to be prudent, not end up in a 2020 camp again. Um, alarmingly, for Swedish uh, conditions, we have the lowest real um, uh, uh, wage situation that we have ever had in data. It not, it's quite interesting also that we have a central bank that talks quite hawkish, they would take money away from the consumer, when we all know that in Sweden we have the highest ever debt service ratio, i.e. we spend, um, we never spent more money on rolling our debt basically. In the US, it's the lowest ever. So we have the situation uh, when in the US you can raise rates, not so much will happen to the consumer because they're not really indebted, um, they, they cleared all that out in the sense that they pushed on to the state level. In Sweden, a lot of the debt from the financial crisis is actually still with the consumers. Uh, the, the other thing that happened in Sweden is that we are, are quite good at borrowing to roll consumption. We are borrowing money short term for consumption. We can see that in, in data. That increases the debt service ratio. So if you increase rates in that environment, obviously you're gonna have a more negative outcome than you have in the US. You're gonna have more impact on financial conditions than you have in the US i.e. all of a sudden the graphs and data makes perfect sense. For us, this is a, a simple sign of keep all international exposures unhedged and, and, and create a, a profit-bringing portfolio of foreign currencies, even sterling. Um, and we should remember, sterling and stocky are the two worst performing currencies in G20 this year. Now, why uh, are we so stressed about Sweden if you look at Swedish metrics? Well, this is the reason. ECB is making a great job of looking at equity market, bond market, money market, foreign exchange and hedging uh, derivatives and they look at how this is traded versus banks, intermediates and they look at how it, it clear and how we settle all this. And they make this by just looking at market conditions and they make an index, call it financial stress. Uh, Swedish financial stress today is a lot higher than the Italian crisis that we saw in 2018-2019. It's higher than the Greek crisis we saw in 2015. It we're not up on the big Greek crisis again, but this is the highest stress we've seen in Swedish financial markets uh, that I think has been recorded. Usually Sweden is one of the most liquid and, and sort of well kept and highly liquid markets. But since the turmoil, the political turmoil last, last autumn, something happened when we went into this year. It has a lot to do with uh, a lot of people moved money out of Sweden. We, uh, we did as well. And that means there's very little liquidity left. And um, if one becomes a bit more critical, you could probably argue that the, uh, uh, the Swedish local FSA has been a bit more prudent on, on, uh, on implementing rules and directives from the European Union than other countries. And maybe what we should have walked the same pace as other markets, because all of a sudden, our market is the least liquid. We have the hardest trading conditions uh, in, in Europe right now. This is unfortunately not an election question, um, yeah, but, but it would be interesting if it was. But this is more of just an interesting data point of making us keep on having a 100% short stocky position. 
And unfortunately enough, uh, Swedish equities are then trading on US macro. It influences equity trading as well, because one should also remember if, if you trade like first North companies, if you put in a, like a million stocky, you should probably expect to trade it for, from that position for two or three weeks. So I think that's a good market to, to use a, a, a broker. Um, preferably our brokers, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's definitely difficult to trading these things uh, today, um, which is why that's super interesting equities, but one has to prepare of the market conditions. Uh, we can skip some of these sides, but the global growth is, is obviously re-accelerating. Um, we have credit and pulse indicators globally that are supportive and positive. Uh, we obviously have the situation that people are still with flows and sentiment preferring North American equity markets compared to Europe. No news there. So that was the final words. Um, so we are still constructive on, on, on equities. We still keep the positions that we've changed in, in the summertime as, as active. Um, we are uh, changing a bit during the little slump that we've now seen in the equity market of shifting out of the US into India. We have uh, bought uh, US equities in sterling. We are buying Indian equities in euros. So we, we hedge those. So we leave an open euro stocky, sterling stocky positions due to the fact that we saw in Sweden. But do remember, we are also heavily invested in the Nordics due to the fact that large caps in Sweden are again trading on US macro merits rather than Swedish. And if you look at earnings revisions, price revisions, we think there are good hopes for a, a, a rebound in equity markets going into late of this year. If that changes, we will change our positions, but that is the, the house view uh, as we speak, and we'll be back in two weeks. And thank you so much for, for your time.